Hello, hello, one, two, three, four. Somebody mentioned that my audio wasn't good on my videos and I should be using a professional lapel microphone. So I got this, I've got this ceramic uh, lapel microphone. Looks like it's from the mid 50s. And I'll just clip this on and uh, we'll use this uh, for the video. So the internet is loaded with them. You go through and you do a search on phono oscillator, wireless broadcaster, uh, AM transmitter, part 15 transmitter. You're going to find it all over the place. And I was really looking forward to this video and uh, building up some of those circuits. And uh, every kind of broadcaster you could imagine are, are uh, through every magazine article of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they're all out there. So I think I bit off a little more than I can chew with this video. This is a huge subject and very controversial. We're talking about part 15 transmitters. We're talking about getting on the air with a legal signal, um, using your little transmitter maybe at an antique radio show to broadcast to your various antique radios. Or maybe you're making a little uh, broadcaster for your son or for your daughter. Um, it, there's, it, it's AM, so it all, automatically it's very, uh, you've got the audiophiles and the line level guys and the balance, this and that, and uh, modulation, uh, distortion, and so on. So this is a huge subject. And I really would like to start at the beginning of the beginning, which is really the turn of the... Uh, 20th century when uh, oscillators like the Armstrong oscillator was just coming in and people like uh, Meisner and, and uh, DeForest were getting oscillations out of tubes and uh, uh, thought about maybe we could get some speech on there. And uh, so we'll start with uh, the simplest forms of modulation and then we'll move up the line into a high efficiency modulation and then um, in the variable efficiency type modulators that uh, involve using uh, screen grids and control grids and so on. But uh, I don't want to dig too deep, but uh, I want it to be a fun presentation as well. Uh, when we're talking about modulation and we're talking about uh, broadcasting and part 15 transmitters, we should really start at the very beginning and how modulation uh, first came about. Uh, discovered in the early 1900s. Uh, the first method was uh, called absorption modulation and it used a uh, carbon microphone along with a battery and uh, you basically had a few turns of wire that you put right around the tuned circuit of your oscillator. And the oscillator in these days were Armstrong and uh, Hartley uh, type oscillators. Mostly Armstrong actually, they came first. Um, the Meisner and the, the Armstrong uh, oscillator that uses the feedback coil or the tickler coil. Uh, those were the oscillators of the day. And uh, you would put a few turns around the bottom of the coil and it would steal power away from uh, the signal by loading it down and you'd end up with, uh, with modulation. So let's just take a look at this setup we have. I've got the little Heathkit AR receiver tuned to the broadcast band. And I have the Morgan one tube regenerative receiver. You guys are all familiar with the Morgan. I am powering the Morgan receiver with a 80 volt power supply, 6 volts to light the filament, 80 volts for the tube. And I've done something pretty silly. I've got a key hooked up to where we normally put our headphones. Then I have a 10-foot wire attached to the antenna. And I just happen to lay a scope probe there so we can pick something up. Now you know if we take the regeneration control all the way up, it will go into full CW oscillation. So we're essentially turning the Morgan receiver into a little code transmitter. Let's see if this works. Okay, so we got the regen control down. We're going to start bringing it up. 
not greatly stable, but Okay, so we've just turned the Morgan Regen into an AM band code transmitter because it is an Armstrong slash Meisner type oscillator. When we put the Regen control full on, it is in full oscillation mode. And we have the trimmers that couple the tune circuit right to this 10-foot wire. Therefore, we are transmitting. So that's the first step. Next, we will introduce the first form of modulator or modulation. It's called absorption or loop modulation. We basically have a little battery power supply, a carbon microphone, which acts like a variable resistor as you talk into the mic, and a coil. That coil is going to be put near the tune circuit on the Morgan Regen. And as you speak into the microphone, it's going to change the impedance of the microphone and it's going to absorb power from the circuit. And this will cause some amplitude modulation, hopefully. Let's see if this works. Okay, before we go too crazy, we are going to make the key transmit all the time by turning this knob. And then we're going to turn the BFO off. We don't need that. Okay, so we're just listening to a dead carrier from the Morgan. Now we're going to attach the battery and get some current to go through that loop. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> if I can get my head down there to try to do this. One, one, two, one, two. Hello, one, two. Hello, one, two, one, two, one, two, hello, 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 one, two, one, two. Wow. <laughs> so I have some dramatic lighting going here because uh, basically I want to prove or disprove a, uh, a controversy that's arisen. Does a carbon microphone hooked up in an absorption, absorption modulation or a loop modulation system require bias or is the impedance or the resistance of the carbon mic itself enough to get modulation so first we will have the microphone passive that is we have the loop around the coil and it's going to be completely passive the battery is not connected we're just going to short the, the mic and retune We are getting some modulation. One, two, one, two, one, two. But difficult to hear voice. Now we are going to hook up the battery. And this is a simple 9 volt battery. We're going to retune. One, two, one, two, one, two. Hello, one, two, one, two. Hello, one, two, one, two. So, there's no doubt adding a battery does help this particular carbon microphone. So, I don't know the answer, but I do know that at least with this carbon microphone, it certainly prefers having bias applied. I'm the first one to admit that uh, my uh, absorption uh, loop modulator is a little bit primitive. It's built into a salt cod box. I don't think you should go out and buy a salt cod box just to make a project like this, but uh, that's kind of a reference to Reginald Fessenden uh, since he was Canadian.
Now, the next type of modulation, really, we jump the gun because there was another method developed uh, by Cole Pitts and some others uh, where we actually modulate the grid leak or the grid of the oscillator. So grid modulation comes very, very early. And uh, we should probably look at grid modulation. Um, here's a few schematics of some of these early grid modulators. We will get back to grid modulation because many of the Part 15 transmitters we're going to work with are grid modulated. Okay, so we now have the next step in the evolution of AM modulation. And that is the one-tube Heising modulator. We have a single triode tube. It's using a choke. This is really a, a transformer that I'm only using the primary side of. I measured the transformer to have a resistance of around 3K. So I know that it's a high impedance transformer. I could measure that. If you measure a transformer, it's only measuring like 100 ohms or 200 ohms. That's not going to be enough impedance to modulate a very low current transmitter like our Morgan Regen receiver. We also have a transformer on the input side. That's for the carbon microphone. The carbon mic has two one half volt uh, double A's. So that's three volts on the carbon mic. And that's enough to uh, produce some wiggling voltage that gets stepped up by this transformer into the grid of the Heising modulator. And then the Heising reactor choke is feeding the B plus to the transmitter. And we have the key down so we have a continuous carrier. So let's try it. I, have a, I now have a push to talk system. And the, the push to talk system uh, applies the bias to the carbon microphone, so I'm not wasting the batteries all the time. Anyway, uh, this is a 6AV6 triode tube with a carbon microphone on the input, uh, directly modulating the triode Armstrong slash Meisner oscillator that's being formed by the Morgan Regen. This is probably the area that we're going to cover the least amount of time on, and that is plate modulation, or modulation iron, like these modulation transformers. Um, it's uh, typically reserved for amateur and professional type transmitters, not used with these low power Part 15 transmitters. But uh, plate modulation came along quite early. The General Electric Company really pioneered plate modulation and again, before 1920, plate modulation was already being done. But this can modulate a transmitter up to about the 30 watt level. Um, the advantages of Heising and push-pull plate modulation is that the efficiency of the stage remains constant. And you're able to put power into the sidebands that you produce when you're making the AM signal. So you have a uh, upward modulation effect, and uh, unlike grid modulation where you're modulating the efficiency of the stage, the carrier remains fixed and steady. Um, this is the output transformer from a common um, All-American 5 type receiver, and it has, you know, a, a primary impedance of probably three, four, five thousand ohms down to your 4 to 8 ohm type speaker. The exception uh, for some of these uh, Part 15 broadcasters is to use one of these transformers and use a high fidelity amplifier on the 8 ohm side and turn this into a high level plate modulator. So that's the one exception and uh, that will give you some excellent quality compared to some of these simpler rigs that we're going to go through. So I've seen a few schematics online of a high-level plate uh, for some of these Part 15 transmitters, but nobody went that far in the commercial world to give you a small phono oscillator or broadcaster to use true high-level push-pull type plate modulation. 
you will see some Heising circuits. And uh, one of the best regarded uh, transmitters, the Ally Knight transmitter, is a Heising modulated transmitter, and, and uh, that's why it performs so well. So what is amplitude modulation anyway? And what happens to the steady carrier when we modulate it with speech or a tone? The combination of audio frequency currents on the radio frequency carrier is in essence a heterodyning process similar to a mixer stage. We get a pair of beep frequency bands equal to the sum and difference of the audio frequencies and the radio frequency, the carrier. So for every tone frequency in the audio spectrum, we get a pair of new radio frequencies. One sideband is equal to the carrier frequency plus the modulating audio frequency, and one is equal to the carrier frequency minus the audio frequency. Thus, the sidebands are mirror images of one another. So, for instance, if we had an audio spectrum that we wanted to use as a modulation source, such as 300 hertz to 3000 hertz, the voice band, and we had a radio frequency of 500 kilohertz, we would produce two sidebands on each side of the carrier wave, 500 kilohertz minus 3000 to 500 kilohertz minus 300 hertz, and an upper sideband of 500 kilohertz plus 300 hertz to 500 kilohertz plus 3000 hertz. And it would look like this on a frequency domain instrument like a spectrum analyzer. So the fully modulated signal we have produced would occupy a bandwidth of twice the highest modulating frequency, or in this case, 6 kilohertz two times the highest frequency, 3,000 hertz. The audio that we produce in the receiver is due to the amount of amplitude variation that we impart on that carrier, not upon the strength of the actual unmodulated carrier alone. So we want to maximize this effect. When we get into a situation where the carrier amplitude has shown in the time domain to be doubled and the valley in the waveform is brought to zero, we've achieved 100% modulation. This occurs when the peak amplitude of the modulating current equals the amplitude of the unmodulated carrier current. Oh, and we're talking about mostly uh, modulating oscillators in this little video. Part 15 world, we're modulating oscillators most of the time. And the oscillator should be run class C, by the way, with grid leak bias. Grid leak bias assures that the oscillator is self-starting. Fixed bias of minus 50 volts on the grid uh, is going to make self-starting difficult. The efficiency, even if we do achieve class C in the oscillator, will be limited to less than 35%. Fortunately, modulating these things, even Heising or high-level transformer plate modulation, uh, you theoretically must have half the DC input power of the stage. So if, so if we were doing a 100 milliwatt input transmitter, we need to have at least 50 milliwatts of audio driving power that's with a perfect impedance match, of course. We're going to need a little bit more than that to uh, modulate 100 milliwatts. With uh, different types of grid modulation, uh, we can even get away with less uh, input power. And a lot of these are uh, driven mostly by voltage. We are primarily interested in two forms of modulation in our Part 15 transmitters. The first is constant efficiency modulation, and the second is variable efficiency modulation. Constant efficiency systems include plate modulation with transformer or choke coupling and to a slightly lesser extent cathode modulation. In constant efficiency the input affecting the modulating stage is varied by an external source of modulating energy. Specifically this is an audio power amplifier through a choker or transformer. This is also called high level modulation. All things being equal, a constant efficiency system will always produce more output or range with our 100 milliwatt DC input limit. I hate to use that word range, <laughs> but uh, this is probably the best way to get a good signal uh, than any other simple system. The second form of modulation that's much more popular for our Part 15 transmitters because it's a much simpler system is variable efficiency modulation. In variable efficiency modulation, the average input power to the stage remains constant with and without modulation. The variations in efficiency of the stage produce the modulated waveform. All forms of grid modulation fall under this category. This system is also called 
low-level modulation. Very little actual power is required as the grids of tubes are voltage inputs. The input voltage in the form of varying bias, according to the audio, produce a change in current through the transconductance of the stage, thus modulating the waveform. Pentagrid or five grid valves have evolved from the 1930s in three basic designs, and these have proven to be good frequency converting devices at the lower frequencies. So they make good candidates for low level modulators. Pentagrid tubes are designed to minimize the effects of capacitance and various other interactions inside the tube, thus allowing an oscillator to be fairly isolated from another source, such as our modulation signal. So there's very little detuning of the oscillator with modulation. The two grids have differing characteristics, with one being suited to oscillator use and one for linear gain controlled signal inputs. So one is optimized for sharp cutoff and one grid is optimized for a softer remote cutoff. But enough about all this theory, let's uh, build a very simple phono oscillator. And it's going to be based on the old standby circuit often seen in uh, schematics uh, on the internet, in magazines. Uh, we're basically going to use the circuit adopted by AES, Amateur Electronic Supply, in their popular kit. And we'll add a little amplification to it. As we get into this AM phono oscillator or broadcaster project, I would like to do uh, kind of a foundational circuit using the 12SA7 slash 12BE6, 6BE6 pentagrid uh, converter style as kind of the, uh, the first part of the project. And we'll see what you can do with a uh, modulated oscillator using uh, one of those uh, converter tubes. And then we'll go into something a little more uh, avant-garde and uh, try to touch some of the different uh, aspects of, uh, of these transmitters. There's really two different uh, goals with these transmitters. Goal one is we just want to transmit around the immediate area, maybe in a uh, antique radio meet or show. We only need to go a few meters. And then there's the guys that want to actually make a radio station out of this, broadcast as far as they possibly can, and uh, match the antenna properly and so on. So there's two aspects to these small Part 15 AM transmitters. I'm going to build the 6BE6 12SA7 style of uh, very simple phono oscillator. And uh, with such a small tube and low power requirement, I can get away with these very small transformers. And I'll operate them back to back. They're 120 volts to 6.3 volt AC supply uh, transformers. We're going to put them back to back and we'll develop the uh, filament voltage and the high voltage from those transformers. Now these are the type that uh, just kind of go onto a PC board. So putting them into a box will bend the tabs into these two holes and we'll put the other leads down through those very small grommets. I really like the idea of using the, uh, the computer power supply parts for the uh, power inlet and the switch. That's a great trick. But I'd like to keep the AC power confined to this part of the box and uh, we'll put the oscillator and the audio input on the other side as far away from the AC as possible to try to minimize hum. So uh, if we really get in trouble with hum we can actually rectify the 6.3 volts and uh, put DC on the tube but I don't think we're going to have that, that big of a problem. Again here's the antenna terminal now for the coil, um, I had a couple of these fairly small um, coil forms. They have a, a, a slug inside. And uh, as you can see, there's not a lot of room on them to actually wind. So I'm going to use scramble winding and build it up. Now you might ask, uh, with, a, with these oscillators, is it better to use a, uh, an Armstrong style with a feedback? Uh, sort of the tickler winding idea, or is it better to use a Hartley style? Actually, both will work equally well. I like the Hartley because uh, when I'm winding the coil anyway, I might as well put a center tap so in. So there have been some uh, negative uh, comments on the, uh, the blogs concerning this style of transmitter using the pentagrid uh, type, type tube. Um, I know that Amateur Electronics Supply, with their little breadboard kit where you build the... Uh, 
essentially you build the circuit onto a, a piece of wood has been popular and some people are building them into metal chassis like this uh, but the results are all over the place some people claim it's working just fine some say they can't get any hum out of it, it it's humming uh, others say that it must be putting out a lot of garbage and some people just can't seem to get the thing to work at all so um, I've never built one like this so this is going to be a learning experience for me too but I really would like to give it the best chance of success the particular chassis I'm using is uh, way too small it's a, it's a minimal size I would say for this uh, project it's basically a 4x6x2 by by box Really, we should be using something like an 8 by 5 or 8 by 6 by 2 box as a minimum for a, a transmitter project like this. But just to give it the best benefit of, a, of, uh, of working on the first uh, try, uh, one thing I'm doing with the IEC connector here is I'm putting two capacitors from the ground to the neutral and the hot post. These are caps that I've uh, rescued out of that same ATX computer power supply and they're 2.2 nanofarads. Uh, 0.01 microfarad would be just as fine. Uh, what we're trying to do is keep the RF off the AC line. Uh, we don't want to be modulating the AC line with our signal. We want the RF to come out of the antenna, not the line. We're not making a line type uh, transmitter. We're making a, uh, a radio transmitter where we're uh, trying to get the RF to come out that post. The other thing that's going to give us uh, a better chance of success is by building the circuit in as uh, tight a space as possible as far as RF goes. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but on that tube socket I've put two ground lugs, one on each side of the socket. And the majority of my ground connections are going, to, are, going to go, are going to go right to those lugs. So I'm using the chassis and the grounding of the chassis to maximum advantage. And we're going to make sure everything is grounded very well in this box. Nothing floating. Everything's going to be grounded straight to chassis. And we're going to see if that doesn't give us the best chance of success with the transmitter. Oh, here's another tip. Antennas here. Audio comes in here, power over here. We're segregating things so as to minimize pickup and hum. And so it looks like it's not much to it. That's about number 33 wire. 100 turns doesn't work. Now I hope you can see this, but uh, I've got the ground terminal attached right to chassis here. The ground lug is attached right to the chassis. And then we have a very short ground wire going to the ground terminal on the IEC inlet. We've got our two bypass capacitors right here. So uh, that's going to establish the AC ground of the system and hopefully uh, reduce our chances of home. Okay, we have a little more progress on the chassis of the uh, 6BE6 AES style transmitter. Of course they used a 12SA7, but a 6BE6 is a pentagrid converter, it's equivalent. And uh, since uh, I've been mounting parts, I've been using the drill, I've been doing some soldering. And of course when I'm soldering I like to use an exhaust fan. This little fan blows this direction, it blows the fumes away, and that's a good hint. Um, keeping those fumes out of your face so you're not breathing in the, uh, the, uh, the toxic fumes from the rosin core solder. And uh, <laughs> your eyes uh, are much happier if you can keep the, uh, the smoke out of your eyes. That, that's a good thing too. So, um, as you can see, I'm using two transformers back to back. This is a very typical way of powering these small projects at this very low power drain. Um, you can get away with these small transformers. But you will not get what you put in if you use the same transformer. Um, usually if this is uh, 
a 120 input down to a uh, 6.3 volts and then 6.3 back to 120. Sometimes you only get out 90, 100, or 110 volts. You do lose some. You don't get it all back, in other words. Now, there are some transformers that have the high voltage winding and the 6.3 volt winding on them already. And that's uh, what's shown here. Those transformers are getting hard to find, but uh, they are being manufactured again, fortunately. I found a vintage one. This one's a little oversized. Uh, this is a, a, a pretty nice unit because uh, it can provide 50 milliamps at uh, 100, uh, 120 volts out on its secondary and a couple amps at 6.3 volts. But I don't need this monstrosity on there for this small transmitter. So I'm just using two low-cost, inexpensive uh, transformers. Um, also, we have an LED, and the LED, the light-emitting diode, is just telling us that the power is on. And if I turn it on, you can see that the LED did light. hope you can see that at least. Now, a light-emitting diode is a diode. So we can put it, or we can power it from the 6.3 volt AC because it's self-rectifying. But we do need to drop some voltage because it only needs about a volt or two to turn on. So um, I have a 1 kilo ohm resistor uh, in series with the LED across the 6.3 volts. So keep that in mind that you will need a dropping resistor to use an LED, even if it's an AC source. There's the small phono oscillator, the AES circuit with the 6BE6 completed. It's built pretty much to print. Uh, the only thing I took license on was, of course, winding my own coil. So the capacitor that I'm using is actually 100 puff instead of an 82 puff. And the feed resistor, which is a 2.2K filter resistor, I think I'm using a 1.5K and uh, I'm a little bit shy on voltage, so that's not going to hurt anything. But um, you also see I have a bunch of tubes over there. Uh, the idea here is uh, to test the circuit with a variety of 6BE6s. And I also have some 6CS6s. And I have a military tube, the 5915. So these are all equivalent to the 6BE6 as far as the, uh, they're all pentagrid converters. Of course, they're going to have different effects. Now, what I'm finding with this circuit out of the box is that it's fairly sensitive to uh, the particular valve or tube that you put in. So we're seeing a lot of variation as I go from tube to tube. I didn't expect that, but that tells you that the circuit is kind of weak and... Uh, it uh, being so sensitive to the tube tells you that it's kind of on the edge of working. So I can see why people would have had, had some problems with this as they, uh, they built it up. And uh, some guys claim it works great and some guys claim it doesn't work so good. Uh, try changing the tube. You may find that uh, even though your tube tester says the, the valve is 100% or good, you may find that the bad one produces a, uh, a better signal and more modulation. So, kind of counterintuitive. Also, I've got one in there now that's got a little bit of distortion on it. You're going to see that. You're going to see distortion. This uh, circuit is not completely optimized for modulation. Will you notice it? I don't think you're going to notice it in the audio quality, but we can certainly see on the scope that we have some distortion. The other thing is, I'm... I'm having to hit this with a lot of voltage uh, between 1 and 3 volts of uh, RMS of uh, voltage in order to get even what you see there, which is around 60% uh, modulation. So um, that tells you this, uh, this guy doesn't have a lot of gain, so we might want to work on that as well. I will do a little bit of optimization on the circuit, but I'm not going to go crazy. It kind of is what it is, like my little high voltage danger there. That's just a reminder that we are working with high voltage here with these tube circuits. Even though this is just a little over 120 volts, it still uh, is going to give you a shock. And uh, 
I got this uh, at about 886 kilohertz and uh, with this particular coil I can go from around 550 up to about a thousand so if we wanted to cover the higher end of the band we'd uh, take that hundred puff cap down to maybe a 68 something like that so let's uh, let's hook this thing up to a source like a uh, a netbook or a, uh, a cell phone and play some music through it and see what it sounds like. Okay, so we're using the little uh, transmitter with the laptop as the source. And I got some issues. Got the squelch on the uh, receiver so we don't have to listen to the noise. I actually have the volume from the netbook up absolutely full blast and we're hardly getting any modulation so uh, the message is you're you're not going to be able to do it uh, with uh, with this you know the headphone output output from your uh, cell phone or, or some uh, netbook something like that you're going to need a little more amplification a lot of people drive these tubes with an LM386 as a preamp or they add a second tube so uh, you, you need to drive this pretty hard. You need uh, line level up around 1 to 3 volts RMS in order to get this thing happy to where it's uh, modulating more than about 20%. So um, <laughs> that's one way to cut down distortion. Just don't modulate very much. Okay, we're going to leave this first video right here. And uh, this is how the circuit kind of turned out in the end with my dual transformer setup and some safety features added and uh, some distortion uh, bias uh, adjustment to make the, uh, the envelope a little better. In part two, we're going to improve this circuit by adding some gain, and then we're going to try a couple of other circuits. And I think you're really going to like part two because we get into some more interesting uh, circuits.